welcome back to school, back to, uh, for many of you, your final year. So it's uh, going to be a bit of a stretch. You're going to see me lots of times if you take all four courses that I'm teaching in the fourth year this year. 4N, 4N, 4G, 4C, but uh, some of those are electives, so you don't have to see me so often. Uh, and let's take a look at your 4N. So you're here because you've, you've chosen this course, it's an elective. Today's class is more a bit about what the course is going to look like in terms of administrative issues. And then next week we'll do a bit of a broader overview of what separation processes are and then get into the details. So, the notes, uh, if you've had a chance to download these notes off the course website, they always get posted before the class. But for today's class, these are not that mandatory. So let's take a look here. Um, this course is not my own piece of work. I built on a number of other people's contributions. The first one of which was Dr. Santiago Kosha. He taught the course in uh, three times prior to me. But then uh, Dr. Ghosh taught it. And then for the longest time, uh, Dr. Dixon, who's now retired, taught the course in 19, since 1984. So it's got a long history in the department and a lot of modification over those years. Uh, but the, the core separations elective has always been in our department uh, for at least 30 years or so. So a bit about myself. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. I came here to do my master's degree. I don't have a PhD, so just call me by my name. I'm not a doctor. I've done extensive work in consulting for a variety of companies in a period of time after I graduated, then recently finished up a glasses and applied and then at Mac for the last two years now, going into my third year. If you're looking to meet with me, I'm in BSB. Um, I'm not in JHE. The way to meet with me, though, the best way is by sending an email to me with what you want to meet about. Um, I generally will meet with you whenever I'm available, but I'm out of my office frequently, and sometimes when I am in my office, I'm just not able to meet with you at that time because I'm involved in some other things. So email me ahead of time what you want to talk about, and I'll absolutely make a, a, a time to meet with you. I also have my calendar posted on, the, on my website so you can see when I'm available to propose suitable meeting times. We have two TAs for this course. Uh, Krishlani is um, getting on her way to Canada. She's uh, she started her masters with Tom Adams. She's just away for a bit. She'll be back next week. And then uh, Hermes up here at the front. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So chat feature is a little weird. <laughs> uh, I'm Hermes, and uh, uh, I'm in chemical engineering, and I'm a PhD uh, with Dr. Shin Zhu. Um, so, uh, there, there will be office hour? <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, we're, we haven't had, we've had a chance, uh, with, with Kushlani being away, to, uh, to, to talk with the TAs. But the way office hours will work with the TAs is um, we found in our prior courses that simply setting an office hour or hours is ineffective. So, the same thing with the TAs. Send them an email, find a time that's mutually convenient to meet with them. And then that way you get to meet with them when you need to in between your class schedule. If we set an office hour, it works for half of you and half it doesn't work for. Um, so that's not effective. So uh, email the TAs as well. In fact, my preference is if you've got an issue with the course material, the TAs should be your first uh, first call. And then if there's anything that's, that you're still stuck with, feel free to email me and I'll have Thanks. See you back. Um, I also, as, as many of you know, I record the lectures, the, the video and audio, and I post those on the course website for you to review after the fact. Um, they're not always going to be the best quality. There's going to be doors banging, there's going to be papers rustling, uh, people coughing. It's not, it's not supposed to be a studio recording. Um, it's simply just a captioning of what's happened in this room for the 45, 50 minutes that we meet. And so I post those, and they're there really the way I explain it to my students is you can either um, you can eat in or you can take out. Right? You come to class, you're eating in, or you're, you can take out, you can go watch the video later on. It doesn't taste the best, um, it doesn't have the best quality, but it's absolutely a good tool for you to use if you're aware of job interviews. I know many of you will be in this time of year going for job interviews, so it's a way to catch up on classes if you've got course conflicts, you can use that as a tool. 
um, to, to catch up. And the most perfect example of using this, which most people do, is if there's a calculation or an explanation that um, you didn't quite get, you can get a chance to now watch it a second time or a third time. Okay, so those are, those are all on the course websites, and you can download them. So talking about the course website, uh, there is learnchee.mycmaster.ca uh, slash 4M3. Please check it regularly. I will not be emailing you at all. I only make announcements on the course website, and I'm expecting you to be checking that frequently, uh, as, as often as you need to. So no emails, but if you do, um, if you, or if you're forgetful to check the website, feel free to sign up to that Twitter account and any announcements I make on the course website also get tweeted, so that way you get a notification of, of any um, announcements made. So the course website is used for slides. All these slides that are up here are available for you to download ahead of time. I make announcements there. I'll post all the assignments there. All the due dates are listed on the course website. There's a calendar of events showing you when all the assignment due dates are, when the midterm due dates are. So that's all, all there for you to um, to and any extra references and readings, and I'll talk a bit about that in a second. So there are no course textbooks, official textbooks for this class. There isn't a, a single textbook that covers the material that we cover in this course. Uh, there are two textbooks though, which combined will will be good. It will be good references. One of which you may already have, the Jim Coppola's textbook. Um, and then Cedar, Henley, and Roper is, an, is another good alternative. So those two are great reference textbooks if you have a chance to, to purchase them or, or get access to them in the library. Another one that's really good is Perry's Handbook. Um, now, how many of you are familiar with Perry's Handbook? A few of you, yeah, so you, you, perhaps other courses have, have asked you to look at it. Perry's Handbook is freely available to you on campus. It's a great resource, it's a, it's a very expensive textbook normally. But the university library has a subscription to the most recent edition over here, and you can access anything from that textbook on, on a campus computer or a PDF into campus. So please make, make use of that subscription while you're here on campus. And I'll point to chapters from that reference as well. And as I mentioned, Sometimes there's some really good articles that get posted in various magazines and other journal entries that I will post to the course website as extra background reading for those of you that are interested in a particular topic. So I'll make, uh, make postings of those. And then one other thing about the website is you're, you're welcome to send me any feedback over there if you maybe didn't understand a concept from the class or something is confusing or you believe that there's a way to improve the course, I really welcome that feedback um, and you can do so on that course uh, web page over there. Or send me an email, either one works. I'm quite happy to accept it. Okay, so you can expect from the TAs and myself to reply to you promptly. Uh, please email the TAs first as I've mentioned and you can CC me to let me know that that's an ongoing discussion you're having with the TA. And if the TA can't meet with you or is unable to resolve your issue, I'm happy to step in. I will ask, however, that you email me from your MacMaster address. And the only reason why is um, I have my inbox all filtered and streamlined. So anything coming in from a MacMaster address gets priority. Um, other emails don't get priority right away. I get to them eventually, but uh, a McMaster address uh, gets flagged on the way and is on the top of my box, so I'll deal with that. Okay, so any questions up to this point on administrative issues? Textbooks, slides, all covered, websites, resources. Anything else you're concerned about? Okay, let's take a look at, it, at uh, some of the grading. The grading is really a demonstration that you understand the material. Uh, people find that a little bit unusual about my courses at first, um, is I'm far more concerned about your approach in solving the problem and to demonstrate that you've got a good understanding of what the concepts are about. That's my primary two concerns. That problem solving strategy, how many of you have seen that defining small plan, you check process? 
Yeah, from which course or courses? My course, my course, any others? 2G? Did Emily teach it? Emily and Kim Jones teach it in 2G? A little bit, maybe. Can't remember too far back. Okay, uh, so define, explore, plan, do, check, and generalize is a problem solving strategy that was created here at Mac. Um, now, it's not the only problem solving strategy. There's many others, and they're actually all pretty similar. Uh, some have seven steps, some have fewer. Um, some of them call the steps by different names. But we will essentially use that process to solve problems, and I'll use that in class all the time. And my expectation is that in exams and tests and assignments, you follow that approach as well. And you'll find it frustrating initially because from your first year chemistry courses and physics courses and math courses, you've kind of just gone straight into the problem and jumped to that fourth step. And it's not that you've been lazy and not done the prior three, it's that you've done the prior three in your head and you felt no need to write it down on paper. And that's okay for shorter problems, and I do that all the time as well, and keep doing that myself. But for longer problems, some of the more open-ended problems, problems that don't have a fixed answer, or have a variety of potential solutions and outcomes, which is really what most engineering problems are, if you think about it, Dan. Um, following that process really shows why you get to the answer that you get. And if you don't justify and show your plan and show the alternatives that you've explored, really anyone that's reviewing your work in the future, which is always going to happen in any company you work with, your work is never gone and implemented by the way. Your work is always reviewed by your colleagues and your managers. Um, if you're unable to demonstrate those prior steps, then you're going, to, you're going to lead into some trouble, right? You're going to have to figure that out then when you start to work. We're going to introduce this formal process right now so you get the chance to try it several times. So you'll see that it's a bit tedious at the beginning. I know that more than 25 to 40% of you won't do it in the midterm, and then you'll get frustrated when you think you're like, why didn't I get any, any grades here? Or, and it's not just for grading on it, because we won't penalize if you don't do it, but it, at least it's, you've not demonstrated any thought in your answer. Right? So please, Please pay attention to that when we see it in problems in the class and in the labs. I will also expect you to be able to take the theory that we learn in the earlier parts and apply them to new problems. Right? As you, it's, it's, it's obvious, but let's, let's state it anyway, that university is no way going to be able to teach you everything you'll need for the rest of your career. So applying what you have learned, these core concepts, to being able to use them in the future is a, is a skill, right? It's not something that you can just automatically do. It's something that you have to practice and try, and you will have a few chances to do that in this particular course, is to look at how you can apply these concepts to your instances. Okay, so, and then the final um, issue that we look at, obviously, is accuracy. Technical accuracy in your work is important. In terms of the great distributions for this course, um, Again, very different to some other courses in that the risk is spread out over multiple assessments. I'm not going to give you a final exam that counts 78% of your grade, because if you have a bad day that day or multiple exams that day, then right there is one chance to demonstrate your knowledge, and if you don't succeed as well as you'd like, that's it's a little bit unfair, right? So what we do is we spread out the assessments across the term. Right from next week, there'll be assignments all the way to the end of the final exam. There'll be regular assessments coming through in this course, and your grade is then a composite of those multiple pieces of work. So if you're having a bad day or a bad week somewhere, it's not going to pull you down. So this gives you a chance to really show what you're capable of in this course. So five or six assignments every two weeks or so, a written midterm in October, Quests are some short tests that will happen frequently on a computer basis. There's a small project in this course and there's a final exam. There is one important issue here. You must get 50% or more in the final exam to be considered class of the course. There's no point when we spread out these grades across multiple assessments that you do well in everything and then just do poorly in the exam. In fact, that wouldn't make sense and we don't see this ever happening. 
It's like someone running a race and then just before the finishing line they decide, ah, no, I'm not going to finish. Right? So you have to be going all the way to the end and demonstrating good, good skills throughout the entire course. But so that's that prerequisite there to pass the course and of course practice is required as well. Any questions or concerns at this stage about that? Okay, let's um, take a look at the next uh, issue then of when the midterms are there. The midterm is set for Thursday evening at 16th of October. Um, please let me know this week if there's any clash, otherwise that venue will be booked by the end of the week um, and that will be set. Yes. We have a manufacturing engineering course that takes place on Wednesday. Okay. So Wednesday night. Okay, so we'll move the midterm to 15th of October, Wednesday evening. Okay, and then uh, the, the midterm will be followed by a collaborative test. Many of you are familiar with that approach that I've used in, in a prior course. Um, a number of other instructors are now starting to use these collaborative midterms. Uh, I'm working with colleagues at Mac and at other universities that are applying this technique, and there have been some good successes from it. So we're going to keep going with that. And for those of you not familiar with the collaborative midterm, is you get a chance to rewrite the midterm the day after or, the, or two days later uh, in groups of four and come to consensus on your midterm and you get a weighted sum of your group grade versus your individual grade. But your individual grade will always take precedence. In other words, if you do better than your group, your individual grade stays. So by participating in the collaborative approach, your grade can only go up and never go down. But what that collaborative midterm does really effectively is it reviews your understanding with a group of three other people in the class to make sure that you're on track. So it's, it is a very effective uh, form of learning and a review of the exam the two days later. So we'll do that uh, the next day or the following day whenever we have class next. The next uh, piece of uh, assessment is the Quest tests. Those are short duration computer-based tests. Um, just to help you stay on top of the material, very low stakes, they happen frequently and as the term progresses, those quest tests may change a little bit because there's some ongoing research that I'm doing with colleagues in nursing and other, other universities on that and we're refining that all the time. So, so we'll, uh, we might see some changes in the system as the term goes, but not, not quite sure how that's going to go. Yet. And then the final exam is cumulative of everything we covered in the course. As with all my courses, the tests and exams are open notes. You can bring in the entire library I really don't mind what you bring in as a resource. I would even be happy to have iPads and laptops and so forth, but the university does not allow me to do that. So unfortunately, I have to restrain you to sticking with any form of paper and any calculator can be brought into the exam. Because the goal is really, as I said, as you saw there earlier, can you apply this to new concepts? Can you think creatively about it? Can you apply a problem solving strategy? Uh, demonstrate the understanding. I've, really have no need to see rehashed examples and, and assignment questions. So, uh, so that's, that's the reason for that. Okay, uh, moving on then, there's a project as well. Um, the details will come at a later time. Every year I change it up a little bit. Uh, it is a short project, so it's an electronic hand-in, very few short number of pages. There's an outline that's due a little bit earlier, and then the project is due later in November. And it's noticed that the project is due early November. We get it over with, and we get to focus on course projects in or N and your other courses that you'll be taking at this time. I know that we get heavily loaded with projects at the end of November, so I like to get mine out of the way and you can focus on other courses. Okay, so that's a very uh, small piece of work to do later. That in groups, or? That is in groups, yes. Uh, so let's talk about a bit about that. Um, the project is in groups and the assignments are in groups. Okay, so the groups are of two, uh, not three or, or any higher, um, groups of two at the very most, and you absolutely can do it individually. There's, if you do not want to work with someone else, you do not have to, um, but feel free to work in groups of two, and if you add up the project and the assignment portion of the course, about 30% of your course grade is then used to group work. So find someone that you wish to collaborate with, 
Um, ideally, it makes sense to work with someone for the rest of the term so you develop a good working relationship that however that flows and however you plan to divide the work between you, I'll talk a bit about that next. But ideally, don't be changing people throughout the term. Um, but unless you're having an issue, oh, absolutely you should. Like, but, so we're, basically what I'm saying is we're not going to force any groups and we're not going to make you stick to any groups throughout the term. You're, you're absolutely free to sometimes hand in individually, sometimes hand in as a group. We'll take care of that on our side of the grade. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Let's then talk a bit about group work. Um, group work is something that that I, I often see deteriorate through the term. We always have good intentions and work and stick to them at the beginning, but then things slip at the end. Ideally, group work should be as follows in, in this course and in other courses, is that when an assignment comes out, the two of you do the assignment individually first. That should be the ideal, right? So you go home, do the assignment, you do it on the bus, whatever, go look over the work at the very least, and then before the assignment is due, you meet up and exchange answers, right? So you and the partner that you're working with exchange ideas, and if your two answers are identical, that's great, you write that up. But if they're different, that's when the learning happens. The learning doesn't happen if you do question one, and the other person does question two, and you staple it together and hand it in, which is what you'll do by assignment six, maybe. But we don't want you to do that. We want you to try and stick to this. Establish a routine right now. Right at the first, second, third assignment, you all, both of you do the questions, come together at St. Hortons, in the library, wherever, exchange answers, and then learn from each other. That's when you actually learn, is when you're talking about it. That's why we do the peer and the collaborative midterm because your learning happens when you're arguing about those questions and answers with each other. Okay. There's a whole lot of good literature and research and cognitive science and the people that work in this field in psychology, uh, you may have heard of Professor Joe Kim and others, they've proven that this works. Right? And that's why we use this in our classes and in our teaching. Uh, so, so make use of that, that evidence, that, that that's a useful way of going about learning. So what doesn't work, as I've said, is someone does the, the, these two questions because they're five points each. Brad does question three because that's 10 points. So yes, that's an even distribution of work. You combine it together, you submit it. You both get the grades, that's fine. But Brad hasn't learned what Sarah's done, and Sarah doesn't learn what Brad's done. Really, at the end, um, the other is going to have to learn that stuff for the final exam at some point anyway. Okay, so why do we cover separation processes? Well, and we'll look at this a bit next week in detail. Unfortunately, we cannot beat nature at this game where things sort of tend towards staying mixed. And if you leave any bedroom to its own devices, it ends up looking like that, or any kitchen countertop. It takes a lot of work to undo it and get it into a separate state where everything is clean and tidy and packed away. And so, so the same principle applies in engineering processes, right? Our products that we do, that we create in a reactor don't easily separate the parts. Clients and, and customers want those products in pure forms. So we have to apply some energy and mass to create the separation. We'll give some details and some concepts that we're going to be using throughout this course next week. But for now, remember that essentially it's no free lunch. You're going to have to put in some money, some time, you're going to have to spend something to separate. And separations always cost money. In fact, we'll give some concrete numbers next week, but most of the money that's spent on an engineering plant is for separation. Okay. So, we're going to be looking at a variety of separators. Here's just a demonstration. I've just taken two flow sheets from the back of a standard ChemEng textbook over here. You can go look this up. Um, raw materials, ethylene, benzene coming in. Reactors, well, preheat them, go them into, uh, pass them through reactors, pack beds, intermediate heat exchange, some more heat exchange at the end. And then the rest of the flow sheet is separations. 
and a variety of separations that are combined together to get your final product in relatively pure form. So it's a standard concept in flow sheets. Raw materials, reacting, separation. So those three steps in a row. And you've seen that in 3G with Dr. Adams. Reactors, separators. Uh, here's another flow sheet. Raw materials, reactor there, R1001, and then the rest of it is separations. In fact, there's a whole second page in this textbook that I didn't show here, which is all just separations. Okay, so very, very high number of physical units in any flow sheet will be just for separations. And there's always pretty much only one or two reactors, and then the rest is separate. So understanding separations is really critical there are large capital cost and a large operating cost in, in most flow sheets. We're going to look at a flow sheet next week that is pretty much entirely separations from beginning to end. So, so not uncommon to see a lot of separations and so we need to, to, to look at them. So my task for you for the rest of this class, I'm going to give you this piece of paper, form groups of three or four or however many you'd like. And Think of any separator that begins with that letter. So what's a separator that begins with A? That's over, okay? So you're going to be going through that process, go through all the letters and think of them. I'll give you 10 minutes or so, then we'll reconvene and check what, what you came up with. And then I'm also going to ask you to tell me what separators you'd like to study in this course. So I've got a plan for this course. I don't have to stick to it 100%. I can modify things up, so if there's some interesting separation units that you as a class want to consider, we can absolutely look at putting those in the in course. So form your groups, here's some handouts, and then come up with some separated names.